Um pequeno país em guerra constante, com menos de 21 mil quilômetros quadrados, uma população de 7 milhões e meio de habitantes, que caberia entre Rio e São Paulo. Tem mais empresas iniciantes de alta tecnologia que os Estados Unidos ou a China. Tem mais empresas de capital de risco, as chamadas Ventures Capital, que qualquer outro país. E também lucra mais, proporcionalmente, com a exportação de alta tecnologia. O jornalista Saul Singer publicou o livro Nação Empreendedora, para tentar explicar esse fenômeno. Vamos saber qual é. Saul, como você explica todo esse número de startups, uh, companies e essa concentração de venture capital em Israel? Well, the big part of the answer is that Israel itself is a startup nation. It had to, to be like a startup to exist at all. Israel had to deal with all kinds of adversity throughout its history, from being a very small country, from being shut off from the regional market, uh, being under attack, many different forms of adversity, lack of resources, and so on. This forced Israel to be innovative or else, and to be very determined and to take risks which is very much the, the, the heart of doing startups. So if Israel itself weren't doing these things, then Israel wouldn't be there. So it's part of the atmosphere, it's part of the culture to take risks and to be very determined and get things done. Could you tell us some Israeli developed technology currently in use uh, around the world? Well, there are lots of things. If you look, say, in almost any computer, there are chips developed by Intel. Most of the chips were either designed or built in Israel or both. The Centrino, the Pentium, uh, the first chip in the first IBM t PC was designed in Israel. The disk on key was invented in Israel. Uh, voicemail, uh, all kinds of things like uh, when you start putting in a search in Google and it starts making suggestions for you, that was developed in Israel. Uh, a lot of things that people use in their daily lives in their mobile phones and the internet Uh, they don't realize it, but they come from Israel. You said in your book that uh, De Gaulle, the former French president, and the Arab boycott were responsible for the Israeli technological <laughs> success. Why? Well, uh, De Gaulle imposed a boycott on Israel of, of military uh, assistance. Israel before that was relying very much on French uh, weapons and uh, air force and so on. And uh, when it was cut off overnight, Israel had to develop its own uh, industry based on technology, started developing its own aircraft, uh, and uh, that was the beginning of, uh, of high tech in Israel, though right now high tech is not mainly from the military. It's, uh, it's independent of the military, but, but the first thing that happened was it grew up in the military. But the uh, army has an important role in the development of high technology in Israel. I would like you to explain that role. That's right. The impact of the military is not so much technology that's built in the military and becomes startups. It's more the cultural impact, since almost every Israeli goes through the military. They get a tremendous experience in terms of leadership, teamwork. They learn what a mission is, how to be very determined, Uh, how to take risks, how to improvise, because th is the Israeli military, unlike other militaries, forces you to, to be uh, more creative, to improvise, because it's a, it's a small military, and the only way it could, it could uh, defend Israel against much larger armies was to have better technology and to be more innovative. But uh, in the other side, army has a, a very strong impact in uh, among youth in Israel is some people very uh, much negative impacted too. Well, uh, Israelis don't like to go to the military like uh, any young people. It's not surprising that most Israelis wish they didn't have to spend two or three years of their lives in the military. But uh, the experience they get there is very important for their lives. It's a different experience than they get in school or in business, they learn things like they learn to sacrifice for something larger than themselves. Uh, that's, that's very important. You, there's a lot of things you learn 
you, you become more mature uh, uh, compared to going to university. If, if you go to the military and then you go to the university, when you start studying, you're, you're more mature uh, and you get more out of it. So that's, that's what's happened to, to Israelis. And, but uh, there was a very important program to develop the startups in Israel. It was the Yosma program, right? I would like you to explain how did the Yosma worked and what are the main pillars of this program? Yes, it was a, it was a government program in the mid-1990s that came at a critical point. And what it did is it jump-started the venture capital industry. Before that, there wasn't really much venture capital at all in Israel. And what it was is the, the government put in money for funds. Uh, the private sector, the Israeli private sector funds were also partners, as well as American venture capital funds. It was a three-way partnership, and the government helped take some of the risk, so it was very attractive to the private funds. And uh, it was very successful. Uh, so successful that the private venture capital funds ended up buying out the government position and now it's basically all private. So the government started the process but then was able to get out of it. And uh, how much uh, money the, the government put in this YOSMO program? It, it was not that much. Uh, it was uh, in the order of a uh, hundred million dollars. It really was not very much but uh, the venture capital industry grew very much after that because all these startups started coming up. It came at just the right moment. And there, there are other things that happened at that time. The, the Oslo peace process in 1993 was helpful. The Russian immigration, a million Russians came from the former Soviet Union to Israel all, all the, over 10 years. Uh, with specialized a huge scientists, all yes. professors. Many of them engineers, uh, many of them were civil and mechanical engineers and they were retrained in Israel to become electronic and computer engineers and that program uh, paid for itself many, many times over. What's uh, the numbers uh, nowadays of startups and venture capital in Israel? Well, every year, say all of Europe produces about six, seven hundred startups. In Israel we produce about five hundred every year. Uh, startups. There are about three, four thousand uh, at any given time in Israel, uh, high-tech startups. And then there's also many uh, research and development centers. Big companies like IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, Google have very big centers in Israel. For instance, Google. Uh, just uh, in 2007, they started with 17 people. Now they're about to have 200 people. It's probably the one of the fastest-growing offices uh, of Google in the world. And uh, this, this is what a lot of mainly American companies have been doing, but I think it's very exciting possibility to have more companies from other parts of the world do the same thing in Israel. But uh, Hulot Parker, uh, I think, was the pioneer, right? It was a director who is Jewish and decided to, to move some equipment to... How did it happen? Well, Hewitt Packard was important. They bought a major Israeli company, but uh, I think Intel was even earlier. Uh, and Intel uh, was the pioneer in a way. Actually, if you look at Silicon Valley, a lot of people say Hewitt Packard was the, the first company to help create Silicon Valley. For Israel, it was probably Intel because they came very early on and they became one of the biggest employers of all of, in all of Israel and uh, they started building chips and designing chips there. It became the, it was their first development center outside the United States and uh, became very, very important for the company. And Intel had uh, links with the Jewish community too? Well, the person who started Intel Israel was an Israeli named Dov Froman, who was working in Intel in a very early stage. He started actually in Fairchild Computer before Intel. He invented in Intel, one of the key products, uh, even before they started making computer chips for Intel, so he had a lot of a high status within Intel, and he said, I want to go back to Israel and start Intel in Israel, and, and at that time it was a crazy idea, because this was around 1977, when uh, there was almost no high tech in Israel, but uh, Dov Froman was very influential in the company, so they let him do it, and uh, the rest is history, as you can say. 
in uh, Israel, the, there's no Silicon Valley in Israel. Perhaps the universities are the Silicon Valley, right? Or how's the, this relation between university, Israeli universities, and the companies, high-tech companies? Well, it's a strong relationship, but like Silicon Valley had Hewitt Packard and Stanford University were the core things at the beginning of Silicon Valley, you have the same thing in Israel where you have very strong universities like uh, Hebrew University, uh, the Weizmann Institute, the Technion, were started in the 1920s, even before the state was established, uh, very far-sighted thinking. Uh, and they're, they're a very important part of, of creating a startup nation. Nós voltamos a falar com Saul Singer, autor de Nação Empreendedora, sobre as empresas de alta tecnologia em Israel. So, uh, so uh, the history of Israel is hardly replicable in other parts of the world. But perhaps the Yosman program can be replicable in a place like Brazil, do you think so? Yes, well, uh, a lot of countries have been looking at the Yosma program to, to copy it. I think, though, a key thing to understand is that it doesn't help to just throw venture capital at, at a country. You have to be ready to absorb it. There have to be the entrepreneurs and the startups that are ready to start spending uh, that are worth investing in because... Uh, you, you can't just increase R&D spending and, and create startups. It actually sometimes goes the other way around in the sense that uh, there's a, a researcher at Harvard named Ricardo Hausman who told us that uh, the reason Israel has such high R&D spending, 4.5% of GDP goes to R&D, is because we have so many startups, we're able to spend the R&D funding. And the same with venture capital. You have to have the startups in order to invest, so it's, uh, it's hard to know what to do first. Yes. Uh, in, here in Brazil, I don't know if you are familiar, we have uh, a very heavy uh, load of taxes. Mm -hmm. And so for a startup, perhaps is the same amount for an uh, already uh, established company. Do you think uh, it, can, uh, it happens in Israel, for instance? Well, the tax, actually, the tax situation in Israel for startups is good. Uh, the taxes are, are relatively low on uh, the taxes that are important to startups. Income taxes are high, but, uh, but other taxes that affect startup are, are, are lower. And uh, one of the advantages of the startup scene is that it's not dominated by one company. It's very competitive. You're, it's a global market, so, uh, so it's not heavily regulated. Uh, and that's been very helpful for the startups. Yeah, you said uh, in your book that uh, to start uh, a company is very difficult. So, uh, because somebody has a good idea and have to have uh, a lot of stimulus to, to go on yes. with the idea and, and transform the idea in one thing, in one product or this kind of thing. And, but do you think uh, there's uh, a lot of factors in Israel that means that push uh, to, to the startups go on? Yes, well, the, the same factors that created all this, I think, are continuing in Israel in the sense that Israelis, uh, it, it's considered a good thing to be an entrepreneur. It's a high-status uh, occupation. It's something that uh, people want to do. Not everybody can do it, obviously but it's something that's respected and it's also acceptable to take risks and to fail. That's very important because most startups do fail, in, including in Israel, whether in Silicon Valley or Israel, it's very risky. So you have to have support for failure. You have to have a lot of determination and drive and you have to have a willingness to take risks. But um, I think that a lot of countries, they think, how can we do more startups? But in some ways, the real question is, how can we be more innovative? How can we be more global as a country or as a company? And I think what's happened is that Israel has, has really helped American companies do this uh, because the American companies have bought startups, they've started R&D centers, and I think the lesson from Israel is that other countries should do it, you know, like Brazil, uh, like European countries, like Asian countries, 
Uh, for, it doesn't make sense that 80 percent of the direct investment in Israel come from the United States. It should also come from other countries and so that other countries can benefit from this synergy between very small innovative companies and large companies that are good at scaling and are close to the markets. And uh, another thing you say in your book uh, is uh, there's something biblical of t uh, taking risks and accept failure. Can you explain us how this relation with the Bible and the high technology? Yeah, it's interesting because one of the things about Israelis is they're, they're, they like to debate and argue and to challenge and uh, they ask a lot of questions. They don't respect authority very much. And I think this comes from the Bible. If you go for look at the story of Abraham arguing with God in, in the Bible, and it's clear that, you know, that Jews grow up uh, with this story. And if they're going to argue, if they see Abraham arguing with God, they're, of course, willing to argue with the head of Intel or Microsoft or whoever. They don't worry so much about hierarchy and, uh, and uh, status. And uh, what about living uh, in risk? How this uh, uh, drives to, to accept risk and accept risk in startups? Well, living with risk uh, is something kind of normal in Israel. Uh, we've had to face a lot of risk, and uh, that's helped. Uh, I noticed that if you go to uh, a kibbutz uh, kindergarten, uh, you know, with these small uh, places in Israel, uh, and it's remarkable, you look at the, the toys that they have in the back and there's broken tractors and all kinds of sharp and rusty things. And in most countries, they wouldn't let kids play with these things. But uh, in Israel, it's considered normal. You just, uh, uh, you don't, you're not too fussy about taking risks. It's the way it is. So, uh, do you think it helps to, to <laughs> be innovative? Yes. Okay. And uh, what's the, the weight of high technology on Israeli trade? Well, uh, about half of the economy is exports, and uh, about half of the exports are high tech. So, it's very, compared to most countries, uh, high tech is a very important part of the economy, and it really is the driving force of the growth of the economy, which right now is growing, I think, the fastest in the OECD uh, of any uh, developed country. And do you think uh, the Jewish uh, world community has a strong role in this, uh, like helping Israel without um, uh, expect any advantage and so uh, leave for instance, this uh, venture capital to, to, to go ki kind of uh, loser than in other countries? Well, I think that, that Israel has benefited from a large diaspora network uh, of people. But um, if you look historically, uh, a lot of uh, Jewish uh, businessmen or companies did not invest in Israel for many years, and in fact only started investing when other companies uh, started doing so. I don't, I don't think it's been the key thing. I think the networking aspect uh, is helpful, um, but it, it's not the main explanation for why Israel's been able to do so well uh, in the world. I mean, one, one, major, one major thing that Israel is very good at is, is globalization. And that's not because Israelis are so brilliant, it's because the country is so small. Because every, every company that starts in Israel has to think already from day one about being global because there's no local market to speak of. They're shut off from the regional market. So you have to think global. And uh, you said, too, that immigration has uh, an important role to develop the startups. Could you explain this? That's right. Uh, almost everybody in Israel themselves immigrated or their parents or their grandparents. It's a very young country and many, many immigrants from 80 countries around the world. And I think that's contributed to this drive and determination and willingness to take risk because that's a natural thing for immigrants. If you're willing to take the risk to move from one country to another, you're willing to take risks. And it also takes a lot of drive to move from one country to another. So these people are, are natural entrepreneurs. And you actually see in Silicon Valley as well that about half 
of the Silicon Valley startups were started by immigrants to the United States? Uh, we see nowadays a, a big problem in Europe, uh, in other countries too, to deal with immigration. Do you think it would be good for these countries to uh, organize and to just welcome this kind of immigration well, for, innov uh, for innovation? Well, another thing, though, that Israel has done is, is work very hard at what they call absorbs absorption, absorbing immigrants. And in fact, in Israel, there's a ministry of absorption. The whole job is to bring, is to integrate uh, immigrants into the society. And I think your countries have had more trouble with that. You have to, it's not enough to have immigrants. You also have to integrate them and include them uh, and make sure they're part of the society. Uh, and if that happens, I think then you can have some of the economic benefits of, of immigration. Uh, do you have an idea of, of the, the weight of the army orders to the Israeli tech companies? Well, uh, most of the Israeli high-tech companies are not military or security related. There are some, but Israel is number one in medical device uh, patents in the world, very strong in clean tech strong in internet and mobile phones. Uh, you know, just recently the, at the big mobile phone conference in Barcelona, there were 50 Israeli companies uh, at this one conference. Uh, so Israel is very strong in all kinds of agri-tech, uh, water, all kinds of uh, technologies. Part of it is security, but it's a small part. Uh, you said uh, in your book another interesting thing that uh, an Israeli is selling coffee to Brazil. Is it true? That's true. The Strauss company, I understand, bought uh, a Brazilian company and is working together uh, with that company in Brazil to sell coffee here. And, uh, and that... Sounds like uh, selling oil to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> exactly. So this is, to me, this is a very good example of, of a different kind of export for Israel, where it's not just technology, because that's not a, a technology innovation. It's a business model innovation. And I think going forward that Israel is going to be doing more of this uh, business model innovation. The, another example is, is Better Place, the electric car system that's going to happen in Israel. Israel is going to be the first country to actually replace gas cars on a mass level. Uh, and Denmark is happening next and, and Australia is happening after that. Uh, and this is basically not a technology innovation but a business model innovation. Very good. Thank you very much, Sol. Very nice talking to you. Thank you.